Daniel Spatz from California, Daniel Spatz Interviews. We will have a special guest, Anastasia Privilova, former WTA player, currently coaching in Germany. And as you know, I've been around tennis a lot in so many years, so and I love to listen. Oh, Anastasia, you're yeah, there. I love to listen to, to, to former players, current players about their life, stories they have to share. Hello, Anastasia. Hey, Anastasia, how are you? We did <laughs> it. Second time it didn't work. Woo. It's fine. Don't worry about it. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm a bit nervous. Like I said, nice to see you. Nice to meet you. The same, but what do you mean nervous? You play tennis. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm moving, I'm more comfortable. When I'm sitting and talking, it's a little bit difficult for me. Uh, okay. But I will where, do my best. Where are you now? I'm in Hamburg. Uh, at my second home. So you're you're living there uh, permanently or just for for a season? Uh, no, I'm living here permanently. I moved here already almost four years ago in 2020 to try out my yeah career as a coach, a uh, playing coach, as I say. And then I actually liked it, and yeah, until now I decided to stay here. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, before you, we start talking about tennis and the things that we were uh, talking in private, uh, tell us about your childhood, um, family, your beginning in tennis. Uh, we're we're going to get to know you and, and you know, uh, privately. Yeah. So where it all started, you mean? Or... Yeah, your family, where are they now? Parents, siblings, sisters, brothers? Yeah. I actually have uh, one sister. She's also an expert professional tennis player. She was also 600 in singles and 400 in doubles in the world. So I can say we have a tennis family. <laughs> Both uh, succeeded. Um, she's two years younger than me. She lives in Bahrain. She moved also away uh, four years ago due to job. And my parents and uh, my brother, they still live in Russia. My brother is 18 years old. He just got into university and he's taking a completely different path in life, not a sports path like me and my sister. He's studying and yeah, doing other things. Um, so basically uh, my family is parted in uh, different uh, parts of the world. And so and how many languages you speak? Well, I think I can say that I speak uh, Russian, English and German. <laughs> my friends say I speak <laughs> good German, but I still don't know if it's true <laughs> or they just try to make me feel good. But yeah, I, I work in German. I live here and I speak also with my friends German. So I guess three languages. Three languages. Why Germany? Yeah, yeah good question. Uh, four years ago when I was on a, actually on the border of finishing uh, my full-time professional career, I got some offers. One uh, possibility was uh, to stay in France, in Aix-en-Provence. And the second possibility was to come here to Hamburg. And I, I just had like literally pros and cons. I was in Aix-en-Provence for one, one and a half months playing some uh, exhibition matches, practicing there. And uh, I also played club matches here. Mm -hmm. And I already was in Hamburg a couple of times. And I thought, yeah, that uh, things which they offer me here in Hamburg we are more reasonable and more clear I got more clue of what I'm gonna get here and I made like a month uh, of a trial and yeah it looked fine so I decided to stay here and and how often you... randomly to be honest it was not plan of my life to move to Europe and yeah. live here. It, it just happened good good and and listen you're really young how old are you how, how old do you think I am I don't know <laughs> No, but it, I don't know, 35, 30? No, I'm 28, actually. How, I'm how old? Younger. 28, I'm born 1996. Oh, oh, 28. Why you stopped that early, your tennis career? That young? So we are going to tennis already, okay. <laughs> no, this, this, um, is, this is a, like a match, a surprise. Random. Oh, I see some guys who know me joined, that's so nice. Hi, Sarah, hi, Alex. Thank you for watching, I feel supported. It's very sweet. 
Um, so early, yes. Yeah, so basically, I stopped at 24. Also, I didn't want to stop because I was a very ambitious uh, player. And uh, my typical childhood dream was to play all Grand Slams. And yeah, I saw myself being top 100 in the world and playing all the tournaments and making my life out of it. Um, but at some moment, it just became very difficult. I couldn't manage it financially. My parents mm. also couldn't support me anymore because it was just, yeah, at some moment, like I said, not doable. And I was trying to find an opportunity. How can I maybe uh, build up my life and on side of that still uh, be a professional tennis player or maybe build up my life and come back later at one or, after one or two years. So that was my plan. And uh, that was the offer here that I will come do some lessons. And uh, in the free time, I will travel for tournaments and have a base for practicing. But uh, at least I have some confidence in life and a place I can call home or something. So I tried, <laughs> I failed. <laughs> I realized that it's more like, it's not really doable if you are uh, working 20 to 25 hours per week and you also want to be a full-time pro. Yeah, that's a little bit of a fantasy more than reality. So I thought, yeah, I just uh, went with the flow. I saw how, where it's going to bring me. And I thought if, yeah, universe will want me to be back. I will be back. And actually, even until this summer, I was still considering to give it a try because I still think I'm in very good shape. Mm. And uh, I was playing a lot of uh, local tournaments and um, practicing with some nice players. And I mean, I'm, I'm a playing coach, so I'm basically always moving and I'm always fit. You don't lose it so easily. But uh, yeah, year after year, I, I always had more things why I didn't want to do it. And in the end, now I made a decision that, uh, yeah, it's over and I'm going in a different direction. Yeah, exactly. But now you're coaching, right, teaching. Um, you see yourself in 10, 20 years teaching or not? Honestly, I'm a person who doesn't look that far. I can't look more further than... But, but, sorry, than Anastasia, years. but when you yeah. see older coaches, right, yeah. working, you see older guys, I guess, 40, 50. 60 you see those teaching every day mm -hmm. six mm -hmm. hours seven hours eight hours on the court under the sun yeah you see yourself doing that the rest of your life i could imagine myself doing this uh but for sure i wouldn't be a coach who spends uh, eight or ten hours on court every day and i wouldn't give my life to this uh my completely for, this i wouldn't do but uh, coaching, yes, I actually really like coaching and I like to work with people. I like to work with kids a lot and I like to share my experience. I think I can bring, a, uh, bring up uh, a lot in people and uh, yeah, I like to help. I like to share. So maybe it will be actually think of my life, but I honestly cannot say that, yeah, that's my, that's my goal. That's my clear vision. And that's what I want to do forever. Oh, hi, Jay. Perfect. Um, Thank you for so, but uh, what, what do you teach? Because you, of course, you know how to play tennis. Uh, yeah. But teaching is different, right? Yeah, teaching is completely different. I think not every person who can play can teach, to be honest. And, and how <laughs> and do you other do? Way around, and how you, but how do you do? Playing, what so. what? How do you teach grips, uh, styles, form? Where did, where is that information coming from? Um, it's. I, I think with coaching for me, it's same like, let's say with learning German, I learned by doing this. I never uh, did a special license or course or whatever. Before I started coaching, I started doing it during, I started giving lessons. So I was, uh, I mean, oh, it's so nice when people are joining. It's so cute. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Um, uh, grips and everything. I mean, I was observing a lot of coaches and uh, first I was working with uh, people like, like with small kids, with adults who are only on the hobby level. So it's actually not so difficult to teach them. And because I was living in so many countries and practice with so many good teams on a high professional level, of course, I knew everything. Like I saw how people are teaching me and basically that was my way. I took best things from every team I worked with and I created my... Uh, like I have my own vision on things. So I never really copied anyone, but I think from all the experience I had myself, I just tried some things. Like I tried actually a lot of things and I always looked, okay, what, what works, what doesn't work. Then I was uh, honestly just watching a lot of YouTube videos, Instagram videos, uh, talking to coaches, talking to people and just uh, try, try to collect the 
all information possible, like everything that I could possibly get. And yeah, I'm just, I was just trying it out. Good. And, and what do you, what do you prefer teach a, a kid, a teenager, adults? What is your preference? I think I feel most exciting working with kids because I feel like from the what, young what, age. What age, what, what age you, you like to Not teach? the smallest kids. Not the smallest kids. <laughs> so maybe, I love maybe. Kids, you know, nothing against them. I, uh, but for me uh, now, let's say, like if I can choose, I wouldn't work with kids up to six years old because it's more, it, it, that's a bit more like a kindergarten for me, to be honest, and trying to get them to the sport through games, through other things. Uh, but um, I'm more interested. And of course, I think every coach can say it. Uh, small kids, it's, uh, it's really difficult. You, you really have to love it and to, to know what to do with them. Uh, but for me, it takes a lot of energy. And that's why I would say a bit older, like from six, eight, 10, 12, and then so on and so on. Then it doesn't matter for me. I actually don't have any specific age preference. Um, and if you take uh, a 16 year old girl who likes to play ITF tournaments, juniors, six or 16, 16, 16. 16. okay, 16, one six, yeah. uh, and she, the parents said, Anastasia, we want you to travel with our daughter, full time yeah. coach, traveling coach. Would you accept that or, or not that? Uh, at the moment, no. And okay. The moment I also got uh, actually in the beginning when I came here to Germany, I was getting a lot of offers to travel with players on tour, mm. also with uh, WTA players, not only for ITF tournaments, but because I recently went out of a tour myself and I still felt it's very pre fresh for me and very emotional. So I actually really wanted to step out of it. And because I was, I think, like, yeah, 15, 16 until 24 nonstop on tour. Mm. I needed a break and I knew that uh, I still wanted to try and give a chance to myself. And if I have time, if I have one week in a year extra where I want to go play, I would go play for myself and I wouldn't do it for another player because then I would feel like I'm missing on something. And for me, it's most important that I feel that I'm doing something happily and not because I have to, not because, yeah, it's cool. It's nice to go on tour and like uh, get the confirmation that I'm traveling. I know that I think that could be that could be a thing for me for future because yeah it's interesting i have some knowledge and i really love tennis and i really i see i feel this fire when i start working with players who want to achieve something so i think i will come to this at some point maybe not like i said i don't know but mm, since these four years and also now i'm still in a phase of my life where i want to build uh build my things uh and hi leah <laughs> Um, uh, but I'm not ready to give myself away to another player and uh, travel full time because I know exactly what it costs and how much time it takes. Going back to your parents, how often you see your parents? Unfortunately, very rarely. Mm. That's also what I'm trying to improve at the moment. So uh, when I was on tour uh, in the beginning, uh, my family was always traveling with me and with my sister. So I was always traveling with my sister and until I at least got uh, turned 18, we always had some member of our family with us. So like our home was always with us as we were a bit younger. And that I, I think uh, it was really helpful and it was really nice because we had like, we had to be very disciplined to train a lot, to practice, like to focus on things. We didn't really have time for a lot of fun or like doing things which we like except for tennis. So this, uh, yeah, having family with you now, as, as if I look back, I think it was a big thing. Um, and after, at some moment, uh, like when I turned 18 and my sister was only 16, there was, I think, second or third uh, big uh, financial crisis in the world. And mm. our parents said that uh, with a whole love and passion and uh, support, uh, all they can say to us that uh, they cannot afford traveling with us anymore. If we want to keep going, then we have to keep going on our own. And basically at 16 and 18, we had to decide if we still want to keep doing it or if we want to stay home and nobody would judge us. And uh, yeah, we could just go to a normal university, be at home and uh, do normal things. But 
yeah, we've been already quite far and uh, we decided that that's the thing what we both want to do and at least we have each other. So yeah, basically at this age, we left to Europe and we uh, were living on our own and coming back home maybe once in two months, three months, and it always became ra uh, more rare because our base was in Europe. And you know, like you always deal between to go to tournament or uh, to stay in base and rest three days and to go to another tournament to save money mm. or to go to uh, see your family, which cost every time at least a thousand euro per person. And it would be only for three, four days. So it was becoming more and more difficult. Mm. And of course our mom and uh, other members of family tried to travel with us sometimes, but yeah, in the and end and it's Anastasia, what about money. Exactly. Uh, You're right. Uh, we see tennis. the glamour of tennis, the grand slams, yeah. the master thousands. Um, but people see that right when they go to tournaments. Yeah. Uh, but how a player ranked 300, 400, 500 survives financially in the WTA tour? Should I say honest or should I say nice answer? <laughs> well, actually, you're literally surviving every day. You are because three, four hundred, you're not earning money. You are just there. You're just trying. And uh, me and my sister, we were, yeah, since we started playing professional tournaments, it was in the age of 16, 17. And like first money we earned, we, uh, we were giving it all back to our parents or we were paying our own hotels and like trying to make it up as a family because we knew like, we were one family and everyone is investing. And so everything what comes, we have to immediately come back. Then no, excuse me, do you further. have, outside of your parents, do you have any sponsors? I had a sponsor for half a year. Uh, mm. But uh, during my whole career, yeah, half a year I had a sponsor that also helped a lot uh, at that moment. But uh, tickets, uh, when you are, for pe people like to know because they think yeah. that you get tickets paid, hotels, yeah, everything is paid. No, no, no. So, so if I say, if I'm uh, like completely honest, that's uh, uh, probably not everyone would ever do it. And now also when I look back, I'm like, Jesus Christ, how was I doing this? It's not possible. So um, my uh, parents, will, my mom particularly, was uh, buying us tickets, for example, to go to a tournament. Mm. Then we would arrive to a tournament, for example, Sharm el Sheikh, 10,000, very popular place for uh, beginners or Tunisia or Antalya, doesn't matter. You, play, you pay around 90 to 100 euros per day for a room, all inclusive. And if you stay for two, three weeks, I mean, everyone can calculate a little bit how much a week uh, for one player costs. And often it was was like that that uh, we would have tickets but as we arrive on tournament um, yeah our parents could also push a lot and give us also money for hotel and for everything but mostly it was like that that we had to earn this money during the tournament to pay our hotel in the end how about sorry do you travel with coaches coach no it was not really possible at some point we had also some weeks in the beginning also when i was junior it was it was much better um then when i was beginning of my professional career also sometimes we had a coach with us but uh most of the time we were traveling either together or just uh, on our own and and the girls that you saw around they they had coaches or they were by themselves alone too it really it depends some some girls had coaches some girls had uh parents some girls were also on their own uh, sorry male coaches or female coaches male coaches or female coaches i think it's mostly male coaches and parents and i don't i don't have a daughter i, I, I raised boys no daughters mm. so mm. i don't know for me it would have been tough to send my daughter to a guy that i don't know you know yeah um, yeah no i think it's a, so it's many a weeks big thing. how do you how do you how do you see that what is your experience share with the audience what what is that life behind that yeah um I would say it's, uh, I think being a girl on tour is a much more difficult uh, journey as being a guy on tour uh, because of your uh, gender. Mm. And like you say, uh, most of the coaches are male and uh, some coaches, they are maybe great in tennis, but not everyone knows how to deal with uh, girls and to deal with emotions, how to support correct, what to say, uh, how to be, how to be strict, but not be too pushy. So I had some uh, luck with uh, coaches and I also had some uh, troubles with male coaches to be honest um, yeah I will never call the names but I had some mm. uh, interesting experience let's call it like this 
And now being a grown up woman, if I can say it like this, I honestly cannot imagine if I will ever have a daughter uh, or daughters who will also will want to be a professional tennis player or whatever, I would be very, 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 um, how I can say it, very careful with letting my child, uh, female child to go away for weeks with a male coach. I'm not saying that it's only about gender. There are also male, uh, female coaches who are maybe um, not perfect, but yeah, I think that's a, uh, that's a bit of a problem and a bit of a thing which is never spoken loud so much. And why we don't see too many female coaches on the tour? That's a good question. I mean, I was asked many times, like I said, to travel, but I have my personal reasons why I don't want. And I think a lot of women also have uh, similar reasons or reasons of uh, wanting to have a family. I actually had my, my first professional coach who brought me everything and showed me what professional tennis is, was a woman. And it's my favorite coach ever. And I love her so much. And we are still in contact sometimes. And um, I wish I could have uh, trained with her longer. Unfortunately, she had to quit our partnership after a year or so. And I was going really successful. I was going through 300 juniors to 90, 90 in only three months. And wow. uh, with her, I started winning first professional tournaments. And then due to health issues, she had to stop. And for me, it was a big heartbreak because I really had the connection to her and I really trusted her and I really felt like she can support me as a woman. And I felt safe with her in a way, you know? So I was completely in my zone, only focusing on tennis. Uh, and she was taking care of everything else. Um, and we worked also with other teams where one of the coaches, main coaches was a woman. And I also can say that that was one of the best, uh, experiences. Yeah. But in Germany, you see women, female coaches coaching tennis. I think it would, it's like five, 10% to 90%. Mm. It's not so many mm. because and, and... it's very physical work. And you have to, like I say, you have to give up a lot of things to be a professional tour coach or even a good coach if when you're not traveling you have to give uh, to mm. give away a lot i think men are most likely to do it because they don't have to carry babies they don't have to give birth they don't have to take care we of we have kids. to we they have to work you have to you have to work no, you have <laughs> to work has to feed the family <laughs> we have to take care of the kids um, i, I understand. think that's, yeah that's the biggest thing yeah 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 exactly uh, if you would have to change something, anything in the WTA, what would you change? Oh, that's a, like, that's a big range of a question. Is there a specific area which you want me to answer what I would want to change or like anything that uh, in my mind? Uh, money, pricing, uh, sh uh, because I think that uh, it, it happens in the ATP as well. Uh, the top guys are making money. But um, the the other ones uh, suffer in the same way you suffer. The guys playing futures, you know, they mm -hmm. don't make money. Uh, to me, the, the gap, Anastasia, is too big in the organization. The guys who makes a lot of money and they who doesn't make much money. So but this I can say about both ATP and uh, WTA. Uh, as long as you are an ITF player, you are always in trouble. So you are not considered as a some as something player. I honestly, I didn't think I was any anything uh, or any kind of a good player until I stopped. And until so many people here in Germany told me, "You're what? You was your number three hundred fifty?" And I was always telling like, "Nah, forget it. It's like it's nothing. It's uh, really bullshit. I never earned. I never played Grand Slam, so it means I'm nothing." Because in my head. I really, I was, uh, I was enjoying it a lot. I had a lot of fun, a lot of fun on tour. So it's not just like, oh, it's so bad. But uh, I think it's a big thing for ITF to make this connection a bit more possible. So even on the early stages, because to even become, to even play your first professional tournament, mm -hmm. you already have to invest so much money and so much time and so much energy. And uh, just to uh, get a little bit back from that uh, to give a hope to get a hope that actually even if you are not successful you can at least balance your life a little bit and at least live out of that I think this ITF uh, uh, thing has to be more connected to hi Jenny uh, ITF thing has to be more connected to WTA thing because like you say the gap is so mm. big that 
as long as you are not making one WTA tournament and you are not constantly playing WTA tournaments, you are only surviving. And I know even players who were not in my ranking, who are ranking, ranked 170, 150, and they are still having all the same problems because then you have to take your team with you, your coach, your fitness coach. You have to get a good physio treatment. You start traveling wider than just for ITFs. And then it becomes also very difficult if you don't have sponsorships and support from outside. So for sure, I think we would have a lot, a lot of more, a lot more healthy and successful female players and also male players if we would get a little bit more support in the beginning not only when you made it but a little bit more in the beginning perfect when you see Sevalenka, you watch the finals the u.s open unfortunately not i think i was giving lessons or doing something i yeah, can't but, even say but yeah but shame on you, me. you you saw her play right Sevalenka, of course. yeah yeah i know i know uh, her very well when you when you see when you watch her playing right or Rybakina, Shatek, how far you see yourself or you saw yourself or not or close when you were playing level wise you know what i mean mm -hmm. uh, for maybe the guy who watched djokovic alcaraz sinner said no i can't reach that level i'm too far or maybe i am close how about you your own feelings about that well it depends if you ask me now i'm, I'm like i'm really far <laughs> i wouldn't make anything but uh, if you ask me when I was between 300 and 400, if I, com if I compared myself to top 10 players, I think I still felt that I'm quite far because all levels which they have, mental level, physical level, uh, tennis level, are really uh, high. Even though I think for women, it's, uh, if you are 200-300, you can still beat someone who is top 50, for example, which for men, is much more difficult and much more impossible. So as a woman, as a girl, I think, yeah, when you have uh, solid uh, results at, uh, even at ITFs, you can already think that, okay, I'm actually not that far from them. And that, I think that's what kept me going because I was beating players who were 140, 120, 200, and those players are beating players who are 50, 20, and so on and so on. So I haven't seen myself super far. Let's say if I compared myself back, back then with Serena Williams, I thought, okay, that's maybe another world tennis. Uh, but I also never, I honestly never wanted to be number one in the world. So that was not my uh, ambition. I wanted to get as far as possible. And I thought, I think I could, I could achieve the level of 100, 150. And I think whenever you are there, also kind of everything is possible. But on this level, I really could see myself because I think I have very athletic body and I have a good mindset. I learned uh, techniques. I'm really hungry learner. So I was learning very quick. Um, yeah. But now it's tough to say, of course. Mariana, hi, Mariana. I to say hi. What was my guest also, Mariana? How are you doing? Uh, Noelia, everybody. Listen, but how you reach that level? Let's say uh, you want to reach, you believe you can reach that level, you are 200, 300. What do you have to do to reach that level of top 10 and top 20 in the world? Um, yeah, there are a lot of uh, factors, a lot of different things which you have to do. I think first big thing that you have to have a lot of patience, a lot patience? of patience. Because you, yes, because I'm you taking, can go I'm taking notes. Down. Yeah, take notes. Notes. <laughs> if I'm saying both, <laughs> you can do scratches. <laughs> patience. No problem. Why patience first? Uh, uh, because I think even if you are uh, getting close to the position which you think you are on or you think, okay, that's more my level, you can still drop a lot because of injury, because of mental breakdown, mm. because of lack of money. Uh, uh, typically unlock, you get into tournaments and you get a tough draw and sometimes you're just not getting this one point, one game, one set, whatever. So patience, patience, patience to you as a player, to your parents, to your team. Uh, don't give up if you have constant not satisfying results. Um, yeah, because also we all compare ourselves to, let's say, you start playing uh, together with some players and at, in one year they achieve top 200, 300 and you are still 7, 800. And then you think, okay, well, then I'm not good enough. Then I'm not that I'm not talented or then something uh, like this. But maybe for you, it will take five years, but you will achieve top 50 level. And those players will stay after 10 years on the level 200. And uh, this you cannot predict. That's why, yeah, patience is the one thing. 
Just keep working and believing. If you chose this path, keep working and working and working nonstop. Um, second thing for me, uh, I think deciding that you have to have a really good team or family supporting you because on your own, you can also forget it. Nobody has ever achieved a uh, highest position in the world, uh, traveling or doing something by themselves. Um, because uh, it's already a single sport. You are a lot with your own emotions. You go on court. And for me, I always felt like you're a tiger in a cage, basically. And you're fighting with your own fears and also against your opponent. Um, but the environment you have around you. So, for example, for me, my first coach, like, I just had to look at her. I just had to have one look from her eyes and I already felt, okay, I'm safe. Everything is okay. I can keep fighting. And that's why I only felt and focused about on what I was doing on court and nothing could bother me. Um, and for, uh, another thing, of course, I also saw a lot of players who had teams, had money, had parents, but they were not really believing in themselves. So a really, really strong self-belief doesn't matter what other people think of you, tell you. Doesn't matter if you think that you, uh, if you see that you are maybe at this moment not so physically strong or technically not good enough. Also, um, without your own self-belief, uh, it's not possible. So you have to fight and believe in your own self and your own authentic authenticity that, uh, in that you are actually a great player and you can achieve it. Um, yeah, that's the third thing for me. And if all of those things let me, combined, let me uh, uh, recap. You are my teacher yeah. now. <laughs> you say patience, never give up, uh, team, mm -hmm. family support, money. That means money because supporting money. is emotionally sure. money. For no, sure. and number yeah, three, self. Like, uh, of course. Yeah, yeah. Number three, self belief. Right. What else? Um, I think uh, what, it's. Uh, sorry, let me let me throw idea. Let's let's. Pretend that I don't know anything about tennis. I'm a mm -hmm. fan, tennis fan. And I meet you in an airplane, in a flight. And how well should I play? How good should I play? Should I have a big forehand, big serve, big backhand? Everything have to be big to be pro, top 10 player? No, 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 no. I mean, no, you can see also on the top level, Coco Gauff is making four double faults playing quarterfinal of US Open. She has a great serve. So... Um, I think we all have got different weapons and it's about improving your biggest weapons and also working on your, on the things which you are not great of. Um, so it's about improving every aspect for me. Also, if you are only improving technically or physically, that's also not enough. You also have to work mentally a lot. So, oh, hi, Christian. Nice that you joined. Um, you have to improve mentally, you have to improve physically, you have to improve technically, and you have to improve tactically and strategically. So, which means playing a lot of matches and uh, yeah, winning, failing, doesn't matter, but you have to experience and improve all of those things. And, How many weapons yeah. you think a player who likes to, who dreams to be a top should have? How many big shots to make the Well, difference? for sure, not just, not just one weapon and not two, I think. Uh, if you have two big weapons, all the rest you can adjust. Uh, because also I saw top players who were not able to volley, for example, even already being mm. top 10, 20. I'm not mm. talking about men tennis. Men tennis for me is a different sport. <laughs> but in women tennis, you can have two weapons. I don't know. For example, you can have very good physics and a very good serve. And maybe decent forehand, and decent backhand, which you can keep improving. And that would be already enough. Uh, if you have very big forehand, um, some touch, but but you are not so fast, you can also improve this and you can improve surf because you can bring some variety in your surf. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be only powerful. Um, yeah, it's all about uh, being honest with yourself, being honest with your team, uh, seeing what your advantages are and really pushing and working on them and also be honest about what are your disadvantages, but not taking them as, okay, it means it's not possible because I have, uh, she has it and me not. No, it's... Uh, about accepting it, working on it, and bringing it to the highest level possible. Uh, I read and I heard that women's tennis is less tactical compared with men's tennis. Are you agree with that or not? Yeah, I, I for sure agree on that. And I think also for myself, as I became coach, 
now as if I'm not working so much physically on uh, my tennis, I'm not practicing five, six hours a day like I did before. For me to win matches, I have to be very good tactically. So I have to see straight away what's happening on court. So, and sorry, no, they said, they said that women's tennis is less tactical. That, that less like tactical. You, uh, yeah. you guys just hit the ball hard. Is true yeah, exactly. or not? Yeah, I was hitting the ball hard until I, feel, until I think I quit tennis. <laughs> <laughs> when I without, tennis, I started without playing with thinking, my brain. <laughs> without thinking where to hit it? <laughs> yeah, I think I was just going for my thoughts. No, honestly, when I quit it, I thought, what a stupid player I was. I could play so much more smart. But uh, yeah, of course, not, not uh, that bad. Uh, but yeah, especially on the lower levels, uh, it's not that tactical our tennis. It's mostly, um, it's mostly uh, hitting the balls, being good physical, but also our rally is much shorter than men's rally. So we don't get to this stage so much to think about tactics because sometimes if you play on hard courts, girls rallies are mostly two, three shots, not yeah. more. So you can't go so deep into tactics. If you watch guys rallies on hard court, they can go easily into eight, 10 balls and they really have to think, have to build up the point in their heads in advance and see how, what they can do next. So that's why I think our game is more tactical if we play on clay courts, for example. I learned my best tennis when I started playing more on clay courts. I really started understanding the game of tennis much more. And I think it's the best way, the hardest way, but best way to learn what actually this game is. Because sometimes when I play on carpet or on fast hard court, or my favorite yeah. surface was very, 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 very uh, fast artificial hard court or something, where you can smash your opponent away. Uh, hi, Philippa. Uh, you can smash your opponent away with two or three shots and uh, that was it because I'm very dominant player and my the only tactic was to uh, push forward and to uh, be very aggressive. So that's yeah. why. Good, good. And if you, if you take uh, four girls, right? 16, 15, 14 years old to train, what would you do? What, let's uh, take, we're going to take you to the tennis court mm -hmm. practicing. You have a okay. basket, you have a basket, you have four girls. Uh, between 14 and 16, mm -hmm. what do you do? They give me oh, playing, two hours. Girls, playing girls or beginners? Girls who are no, no, no. Uh, they, they play ITF, junior tournaments. ITF. You are in charge of them. You have to train them for two hours. Mm -hmm. What would you do? Yeah, it really depends. If uh, Is it a practice before tournament? Is it practice during tournament? Is it practice no, they when are, we have the whole practice week? They, they are. Uh, they, they finish the tournament. They just have a couple of weeks for training and for... Mm -hmm improving get better what, what would you do with them what what would be the the schedule the script the lesson plan for you well it would be for sure combined uh, so i would i think i would work on each aspect uh i would first i mean it depends also if i know players i would talk to them first about how was the tournament what have you been struggling with the most uh so i really for me it's important the feedback of a player so the player has to first even if you're a young player to understand, okay, what went wrong? And if a player does understand, so at least you have to try to get it out of her or him. Because without knowing what they did and what their problems are, me as a coach, it's very difficult to guide them. I know a lot of basic trainings, plans, I know how to practice, but if uh, we don't communicate with each other, then it's also, my pr practice will be kind of useless, even though they will still improve for sure some shots, which I will bring them. So first I would talk to them, uh, I prefer if it's a group lesson, for sure they have to be uh, practicing everything uh, by playing rallies or points with each other. Uh, for sure a lot of serve because serve return will always be not practiced enough. And I think I, I would take some time to see in general what they're doing and work on basic shots, uh, work on, like I said, serve return tactics, move them a lot and just see uh yeah I, I think i would see during the practice also and uh what they're doing how they are participating in this hour yeah and how do you manage four players in one court well i do actually uh, in germany i i practice since two years uh dumb training it's called uh, our women's team and there's always mix of players but of a good players uh playing uh so first second team it's either ex-pro tennis players or young players who are just beginning their journey so actually that's what i'm doing every week and yeah that's a lot of 
there's always a lot of uh, hitting trainings and I always take one topic. For example, one week we take topic to be more consistent on the forehand or mm. we take a topic to be, uh, to improve our slice, which is also practice not enough, or we take a topic to improve serve return, uh, placement of serve and return. And uh, I normally base my lesson on, uh, based on the topic and I see how it goes. So if I want to, I, I would practice doubles also, I would practice, practice going to the net. And yeah, I mean, there are so many things you can improve and uh, yeah. it's never perfect. So yeah, it really depends on the situation. But uh, I find it interesting to practice also. I find it more difficult to bring a good quality on a practice when you have uh, four players on court. But there are also th things what you can do because uh, grown up players can work pretty good with themselves and you just have to set the goals like footwork or they, where they have to play, what they have to achieve, if it's movement, if it's consistency, if it's playing points, if it's, uh, it's actually, I also like to do a lot of mental things on my tennis uh, practices because this is also, these I learned in Netherlands, uh, this I don't see a lot that people do. And girls are way more shy to show their emotions and practices and to do some funny exercises, for example, complimenting themselves. And I think uh, mentally uh, you can even improve yourself during a practice. And uh, that's what I would also focus on a lot. Uh, Dennis Axel, he has a question. Especially in a group training. He doesn't get along. Pro what, how do you manage that? Because it could happen sometimes. They, 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 what, what happened? If they say... If if he, one of the girls doesn't get along with the other ones, how do you manage that? Oh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. <laughs> that's, I mean, I um, get, get along with each other. I just try to calm them down somehow. I don't know, maybe say a joke or like mm. uh, come to the side of one girl and not to say, okay, you are right, you're wrong. Never. No, I just try to, I see who is getting emotional and who is maybe provoking one another a little bit uh -huh. or someone is more tired. So this person starts to get more emotional. So I just try to communicate with this person and uh, to calm this person down first and to go to another person to, so it's like, even in a group, it's uh, personal working. It's like trying to make the balance. To work. talk to make it work between other everyone, yeah. right? No, talk... just scream to them. Okay, shut up and work. No, it never <laughs> works with girls. Yeah. And uh, nobody would like it. Also, I wouldn't like it. Um, yeah. Okay. Personal care. Perfect. And I said, we have uh, maybe 10 more minutes. Time flies. Uh, time flies. I want, I want, okay. Thank you. And I hope you're having a good time. Um, so, so uh, three, uh, I will say three questions. Uh, yeah. One, advices. Give away advice for a, a young girl who dreams to be a professional player. What would you tell them? Uh, yeah, that's a good one. Um, well, first of all, uh, I'm proud of you, girl, that you decided to do it. That's a very interesting and difficult journey. So follow your dream. Uh, never give up. Doesn't matter what people are telling you. Uh, second, um, yeah, be a aware and uh don't be shy to ask for help or support if you feel like you are not feeling uh well enough uh after or during your matches during your practices so mm. for me what i learned and i learned through my whole life and what if i if i can i also wanted to say something in the end of interview actually now you brought me to this topic a little bit uh learn to talk learn to speak about your feelings about matches and also about your personal feelings to people you trust and to people who you think are care for you um either if it's your coach or your mom or your friend don't keep your emotions inside you because that's what bring brought me and i know a lot of other female players down a lot because we are too shy we're too scared to say that something bothered us that we are sad that we are heartbroken and that's what keeps you away from success actually and not everyone has this ability to be open to talk and to ask for help. So ask for help mm. if you need it. Ask for support if you need it. Don't be shy and don't be, uh, don't think something is wrong with you. Um, third advice, remember that professional sport is not for everyone. Mm. <laughs> and if you decided to choose it, uh, it's not only fun, it's a lot of fun, but it's 50% of fun, success, traveling, uh, meeting very beautiful people, mm. getting along with people, learning life through the hardest and most interesting way possible. But another 50%, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of uh, things which nobody see, which you have to uh, put inside. It's a lot of days, weeks, uh, months, years of work. And uh, yeah, if you're not ready for that, better don't start it because then in the end, 
you have no one to blame to blame <laughs> when uh, things get tough and things get uh, difficult. Yeah. So you have to be ready to work really hard every day and sacrifice a lot of things for that. Perfect. If you want to be a professional. Now, advice to the coaches, female co male coaches who wants to coach girls. What advice based on your own experience and what you see, what you've been through? What would you tell coach? the coaches? Uh, coaches and general if you want yeah you're running you are invited yeah. in a in a symposium coaches symposium to talk about coaching female players what would be the best more important advice to the coaches when they are trying to coach a female player um i would say to the coaches guys please be very gentle and very kind on on girls and on female players it doesn't matter the age or part because like i say uh, of this disability to talk like guys, they can scream, they go to locker room, they talk to the guys straight away. They are, uh, they more naturally are letting go of those emotions. To the girls, uh, take extra care. Even if you see that girl is uh, very tight and uh, is in the mood, mm. hormones, whatever, still try to be gentle, try to be understanding. Don't push, don't uh, force her to anything. Uh, give her room to feel good, to feel safe to talk, to express her feelings, emotions, and then guide and then push and then uh, try to bring something up. Because I think that's, that's why a lot of uh, coaches, I heard from some coaches, not a lot, but some coaches, they are not really interested to work with girls because we are very emotional, we are very crazy, we are falling <laughs> in love, we want to quit, we want this, we want that. Um, we are more difficult for sure, but uh, there is a way to work with us. <laughs> Just try to understand us and accept us the way we are. Okay, and then you get let me. <laughs> sorry, let me put it in this way. You yeah. come in, you come to train with me. Yeah. You are my student, my player. You show up. You are in bad moods. That mm -hmm. hey. Yeah, can can happen. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, but how should I act? How? What are you expecting from me? as a coach let's act you come to the lesson and say hi anastasia how are you doing say good <laughs> i say oh my god okay not today i'm leaving yeah. so exactly that's, what, that's the way what treatment you are expecting or you suggest the coaches to give because sometimes it's hard for us we don't know what to do really yeah i know we are we are pain sometimes <laughs> how do you what do you what are you expecting from that coach that day that you're not feeling well well first if you see straight away i'm not feeling well just ask me how am i feeling and if you see something is wrong uh, like ask me if anything is wrong if you can help somehow okay let's if say i'm, ready, I'm, I'm your I'm student now i'm yeah. your student and they get say i don't know Yeah, that's a great one. That's a great one. They say that. I mean, I'm just how trying you, to how, remember if I Are you? Was... No, it's funny because you ask, are you okay? Yes, they said. You're, <laughs> you're not okay, I said. What are you talking about? Oh, are, you, are you feeling well? Yes. <laughs> okay, I think there are two options. If I'm not getting into contact with you, if uh, apparently my answers are like, shut up and leave me alone, you will not understand me anyways. Uh, just leave me alone and don't pay any attention. Don't push me. Just set up the exercises. Do your practice like nothing is happening. Okay. And see how it's improving in a half an hour. Because normally if we know physics, we know biomechanics. When a girl starts running and moving and doing things, you, your blood is flowing, uh, you start sweating, okay. your endorphins are going up. So it can be that in the beginning of practice, as I enter, I maybe had a terrible night, I had a fight with my boyfriend, or I had fights with parents, or I just had a bad day because I had my period. But after half an hour, it can be a different story. So just leave me in peace because no contact is not possible to uh, do anything. Let me be how I am. If after half an hour, uh, nothing changes, try to get uh, to contact uh, with me again. Uh, maybe first thing i will already be more loosened up and more uh opening up to you okay. because i see you're trying and i also normally understand that i'm not uh, acting good but i cannot control myself so i'm very in defensive mode like don't touch me maybe after half an hour i will give you a little hand to okay you can ask me you can you can talk to me you can guide me and then you like regarding on that you see if you can start uh yeah giving me tips pushing me and stuff and just like don't even ask questions because I think in this case, uh, girls might uh, loosen up and 
because you don't push us, because you don't push me, I will want to talk to you by myself. Or the problem will go away and I will just enjoy the practice and be there because I understand, okay, well, do I want to review so, you in so the practice or do I want to do something? So as a coach, you suggest not making a, that a technical, right to technical, talking too much, drills, yeah, just not, rally. No, just, no just, don't do it because they will not be, uh, it's not going to be any useful. Receptive. They will not be receptive. Yeah. Just Perfect. let it be. And observe. Let it be and observe for 20 minutes. Play, right? Even I just not play. Now, maybe 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, just play, just do things. Because sometimes we also just need this attention. And when we see, okay, he's actually just doing his thing and I'm on practice and he doesn't care, then I'm like, ah, okay. <laughs> then I'm also going to be normal. Should I ask you what do you like to do today, for example, or not? Yeah, I think in this uh, beginning moment, it's either just to uh, follow your plan, like say, okay, today I prepared this and that, and we're going to do that. And of course, if I'm like super terrible, which I honestly never did, I think, uh, because I had too much respect to my coach and to the time which I spent on court, mm -hmm. and I knew every minute counts. So from my perspective, it's difficult for me to say because I was very unspoiled player and person and still in my life. I like, uh, if I go on court, I know I go on court for me, not for you. So... Excellent. I would just uh, listen to your guidance, but maybe I would have a poker face, but I would still uh, listen and do what you say. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think it really depends on character. Maybe some people, some girls want to hear. I have some hobby uh, girls who are really don't like to listen when I tell them something. But if I come with them as a friend and say, okay, girls, what do you want to do? Do you want to play this game or this uh... game? they immediately change. They immediately loosen up because they feel, okay, we are not straight away pushed and told what to do we actually can uh, choose and then also so you somehow have to get into connection with me because if you don't get into connection there you can forget about it or you can just say pack your back and go home <laughs> exactly and the last uh, advices are for the parents of players yeah. what advice to parents yeah to par parents even more patient than to players because to be a parent i think it's a more difficult job than to be a player because as a player you're playing you're in action as a Parent, you observe, you count money, you are losing your nerves, you are uh, struggling, you are getting sometimes even more heartbroken for your child than you, and you get too much into your emotions. And honestly, we all feel it. Like all, ch all children feel emotions of their parents, even if they're far away. And especially if they're sitting there next to you should for I, the tournament and stressing uh, and shaking. Anastasia, let me yeah. ask you this. Should I uh, always assist to the practices As uh, to watch the... Yes. No. No, no, no. Hell no. No. <laughs> For me, I actually like my parents to be uh, away from my professional process, but they also never wanted to be around. They traveled for us with us on tournaments to support because we were young, but they were never involved in our training. So if uh, you have to leave your child, you have to find a team. So my mom was always looking for a team. And if she was satisfied, she would get to know the coach and she would see the base she would maybe be there first two three weeks this is important to be with your child too so you get in into the process and you see okay the coach environment i can trust and after leave your child alone and if your child needs you after practices to help to support to uh, i don't know cook for you or uh, whatever it is be there but don't get involved into training don't get involved too much into process because then it means you don't trust and uh, the player will also feel it. It's like, okay, why why is my mom or my dad are so much involved in it? Um, it means something is wrong. But it's personally for me because I'm from my character. I'm very independent and I like to be independent if I'm doing something. Otherwise, I don't take myself seriously. And if I ask for help or support to be around, then surely, yeah, it's cool. If, uh, sometimes they come to watch or they sometimes they come to talk with the coach or with you. But it should be more coming from player. It shouldn't be forced again from parent and like, okay, I'm going to sit there and watch every practice. I would feel uncomfortable, but maybe there are players who would love it. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Like and for the last... parents, it's also important to hear and see uh, the player, to see their child as a professional, not as their child. Great, great. And, and, and you, um, when you grow up, uh, you grew up uh, admiring something? You admire any player? When you were a kid, teenager, little one. Yeah, of course, Marat Safin. <laughs> most talented and most beautiful tennis player in the world. And I was a fan of Martina, uh, Martina Hingis Martina. as a woman yes. player because I thought she had the greatest spirit and most interesting tennis. And 
yeah, fighting uh, abilities in the world. I, I just thought she was great. And also very And the last supportive. question for you, uh, people will love it. Um, this interview is going to be my YouTube channel later. Uh, how do you describe the uh, current style of players, female players, if you have to come up with a definition of the style? Mm -hmm. I would not say that uh, I cannot come up with one style. I still see different styles of players, but mostly, mostly, uh, I think women's tennis is very physical, very aggressive. Uh, a lot of top players, they're playing similar tennis. They have very big serve. They go for big shots, uh, power, 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 power and consistency, of course. Um, but if I look at top players, um, one of my uh, actually players who I admire at the moment, it's, uh, for example, one of them is Karina Muchova because I think she's playing so smart and interesting and intelligent tennis. And that's why she can get a lot of, power tennis girls away from court just with her things tricks and uh yeah i i could never win against her yeah. <laughs> i think i lost against her four times and i was always better ranked but i could never reach her i was playing this aggressive tennis and she was always there like doing her tricks and things should we, uh, but mostly it's physical Anastasia, perfect should we teach as coaches all the shots and little girls i think variety in the also in the young age and the young stages is, is, is important because if you don't learn it in the young age, it's more difficult to trust yourself to do it when you are already, for example, playing ITF tournaments. Okay. I think every aspect of the game should be brought into your tennis as early as possible. So not like until 15 years old, you only hit a uh, forehand backhand from the baseline and forehand uh, return and serve. And then all of a sudden you start teaching uh, drop shots, slice. Yeah. Now on the top level, you have to do to be able to do every single shot and you have to have a variety. Otherwise, you will never break through. I think that was one of my things which I wanted and I still I'm still playing and I still want to maybe improve. And I'm, I'm actually curious about like playing different shots, but you have to get out of the box there. My example is uh, Yannick Sinner, who was uh, a top uh, top five or top ten in the world. And he said, I don't care about results. I want to do new things and I want to improve my game. I was like, I think I fell onto the ground. I would fell into his into his legs, into his knees when he uh, like to say, yes, that's the only way how you're going to become a top, top, top player. Not just a good player, but top player. Don't be afraid to get out of uh, comfort zone and uh, learn new things, new shots, new tactics. Fantastic. Anastasia, it was a fantastic hour. Uh, thank you so much, and we did it. Thank you. Yeah, we did. It was an hour already. Wow. Yeah. But you promised me that I will be able to say something uh, to to the crowd. Yeah, we have. Uh, have two, you have two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. okay, I'll try my best. So, to all the girls who are starting playing, uh, played or whatever, uh, all the female players, uh, I want to say that uh, again, it's not a, it's not an easy journey to be a professional. And it's an asset in general. So, um, like I already said before, don't be afraid to ask for support and help uh, because a lot of players are traveling on their own and they don't have a possibility to have a family or uh, to have a nice coach or to have a therapist to help them. And that's why we have a lot of traumas and a lot of unprocessed emotions mm -hmm. and things. Uh, and then we transfer them from tennis court to a real life and it goes uh, in a circle. So I actually always felt that because I went through a lot of things uh, by myself through everything uh, possible, what you as a player and as a girl can go through, um, I really always felt the purpose of uh, helping others in this. So it doesn't matter if you're going pro, if you're playing just in, in uh, your country or whatever, I want to be a person who can help you, support you and give you a hand in this. And uh, if you are scared or afraid to speak to the whole world, to speak to your parents and something is bothering you and your connection to your coach, uh, in your connection to your parents, maybe in your connection to tennis in mm -hmm. general and to your matches, you have uh, self-hate or you lose your self-worth. I can be a person who can give you an advice and who can help you and uh, who can listen to you. Uh, not because I want to earn money on that or something, but because I feel very big purpose behind it. And I was the one who often felt like I want to speak, but I can't. I felt numb. And that's very difficult. And that can take months and years of uh, processing for you. So, yeah, if you are one of those players who 
wants to be heard, who wants to get help, who wants to get support, but you cannot afford it or you are too scared, you can write me on Instagram and it will be anonymous. It, uh, nobody will ever know about it. I will just be there to listen to you. And if it's one girl in the world who I can help, I would 100% do it. So, you yeah. Thank you for the it. opportunity. Of course you will do it. Anastasia, fantastic. Thank you. Congratulations. The best of luck and stay thank in touch. You. Yeah, thank you. It was fun. I love it. And I'm going to send you the link in the interview uh, when it's in YouTube, okay? Yeah, thank you very much. And and that is going to stay in, in my uh, Instagram. So I'm going to share it with you right now. You can share with uh, your uh, friends and colleagues and everything. Oh, yeah, with a okay? pleasure. Maybe they will want to rewatch it and say, wow. Yeah. It was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. The best Thank of luck. You. And enjoy Bye -bye. your day. Take care. Bye. Thanks. I see.